Oh man, did you see this? You see this just broke. Ian Rappaport. The NFL and the XFL and the USFL are not merging. That's they're not they're not gonna merge. Yeah, it's like it's like they're where are not, we going with this? Uh they're not going under one umbrella. Oh uh, and, and uh and and so you don't have to worry about Vince McMahon's dirty money infiltrating the NFL. I'll just Keep tell you this up. much. If the NFL could stand to make a lot of money out of the merger, they would do it. They would do it. Keep our, keep our NFL boys pure. I don't want any of that dirty, dirty uh, Vince McMahon money in my in my NFL. That, I'll tell you what. I, that tweet almost made me nervous. I I thought who was going to say they were Ooh, merging. Yeah. I I was going to have to I was going to have to write many many blogs about my morals, um, yeah. and it was going to be exhausting. But I was going to have to do it for the you know for the good of my morals. Well, the money wins out at the end of the day as we've oh, seen here with the PGA and live golf uh, merging. So that's the I, thing I will say the biggest, the totally biggest thing is it's a slap in the face to all the golfers that, you know, took a stand and said, we'll, we'll stick with the PGA only then for a year later for the PGA to turn around and say, actually now we're, we're yeah. going to merge with them anyway. Yeah. I think to me, the only way it's spun is a good thing for them is that there's now going to be a lot more money coming into the PGA, they will get their big checks. Now guys like Rory and, and, and JT and Jordan, Rom, Scotty Scheffler, the guys that didn't leave Colin Morikawa, the big names who didn't leave everything that I've read so far is it looks like they're going to be compensated for not leaving. Um, and, and, um, Listen, these guys are all wealthy beyond their years and 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 generational wealth. If you're a great PGA golfer who had the chance to leave, um, if you're investing right, you're not filling, you're just gambling it and and drug uh, drugging it away at the at the casinos late at night, then you're set. Um, which it seems like most of these guys are. So I don't want to. I, I it's tough. I I do the to me the biggest thing is I'm trying to wrap my head around why this has happened, like what. Like, it, it feels like it fell so quickly into all of a sudden, like it came out of complete left field. I was not expecting on Tuesday, June 6th, to have to be like, whoa, breaking news, Liv and PGA have merged. Um, and so to me, that's more of why PGA, why the PGA caved the way they did. I mean, if it, it, the only thing that makes sense to me is they're like, as soon as Brooks won, as soon as a Liv golfer won, they like, pooped their pants and they ran scared. Like I, I, but if you look at the live golf ratings, no one's been watching this thing. No. Yeah. And, and so I don't get why they're so, so panicked, but uh, they, they made the move. And at least now, if you're one of the PGA guys who stayed and you're going to get more money from this, especially if you win tournaments, the prize is going to be bigger. Some of these big game name guys are going to be compensated. The guys coming back are going to get fined. They'll try to make it as fair as they can. At least they can they can always sit there and be like, I didn't I didn't lose my moral compass. That they can hang their hat on that. They which can. they, they were can. hanging, yeah. they were hanging their hat on that anyways, because they knew they were losing out on so much money. They were hanging their hat on that anyways. And I think they're still gonna be able to at least hang their hat on that. Um and either way, uh I'm gonna. I, I I thought about you know going on my other show doing like a like a live report, but I need to let this thing settle, let kind of the dust clear, and have a have a good understanding of exactly why it all happened. Because again, my, the biggest thing to me is is like why why it's so shocking like why the PJ felt the need to do this at this point, unless they were really scared of the upcoming litigation and the and the trials coming that they were going to go to have to go to court to settle on guys getting losing their PGA tour card. Maybe they were really worried and they saw the writing on the wall. They were going to end up paying these guys out big money or something. And so they, they, they get the kind of their cake and eat it too, in the sense that they're getting the influx, they're getting their stars back. They, the PGA, it looks like is going to be able to kind of control all this and be the, be the leader of it all. And like live as a sanctuary of the PGA and all this stuff. Um, I don't know. It's, it was shocking. Yeah, it's it's possible they saw the writing on the wall for the longevity of the PGA in general. I mean, maybe there were some signs early on that they were going to, you know, crumble uh, slowly away into nothing. And so try in an effort to get out ahead of it, figured they could strike while the kettle's hot and at least um, 
you know, make a deal before Liv smells blood in the water and pounces eventually to overtake everything. I don't know. We'll see what happens with the charitable organizations because obviously the PGA is like a huge, huge benefactor to so many charities. Like, I wonder how those are going to be affected, uh, you know, because like some smaller charities in some of these smaller towns like the John Deere Classic out in Illinois and stuff like that. I mean, I wonder what happens uh, to some of those that maybe, you know, banked on the one particular tournament uh, for all year long to make up, I don't know, 40% of their, you know, yearly earnings or something like that. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, no, this is definitely something where it's going to be a story that uh, evolves over time. We're going to find out more about what led to these circumstances, but very interesting. And obviously uh, with that news breaking today, we had to start things off. Let, let it be that. known, Dan and I still turned down a six-figure offer for Liv to sponsor the show. Yeah. We did. Yeah, yeah for sure. It was going to be the football Liv. Last if we're going to be bought, it's going to be from Russia or China, not the Saudis. <laughs> right. That's okay? right. We want, That's right. We want to make that known. We will do business with China. <laughs> I can't even say that. It's just it's horrible. Uh, we won't. We don't want to do business with any of them. Uh, we'd love to do business with like uh, Miller Light, uh, but otherwise, uh, otherwise, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll just that. we'll wait. We'll have to wait until until our day comes. We'll keep the door open, and uh, you know, yeah. we'll we'll be, we're in a position where uh, we can be very choosy about who we ch- uh, decide to work with. Uh, so, you know, yeah, you're all gonna have to compete for our services. But totally. uh, we've got a, a fun one coming up here today on the Football Lounge NFL Mandatory Minicamps beginning. Uh, we have some more news in the gambling saga that continues to plague the NFL. Uh, the Bills sign yet another edge rusher, uh, and Tom Brady uh, confirms some things that we already knew, uh, but nonetheless, uh, he put it out there uh, for the world to see. And then uh, the big part of our show today, we'll be discussing uh, three of the teams that we expect to see the biggest change from uh, from 2022 to 2023 this upcoming season. So without further ado, let's get to it. So the NFL mandatory mini camp, mini camps are completely underway. So now we are officially ready to see uh, these teams hitting the gridiron in full force, Mark. Uh, The Jets, I think, did theirs, like, early. So they actually announced that they're, like, taking a week off, I think, next week or something like that. It's, uh, I guess, something that doesn't happen very often, but they felt really good about uh, what happened. I don't even know if Aaron Rodgers went there. I assume he did uh, if he was going to try and get acclimated to his new teammates. But that's the only news on that front. Otherwise, uh, it's just another kind of milestone in the NFL calendar. It's a yeah, it's a check off the of, off the list of things you got to do before you get to opening kickoff. I will say though, it has been fun. I just saw. I mean, I've obviously am inundated with Justin Fields to 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 DJ Moore clips, and <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. and but but also I saw a, a viral clip of Anthony Richardson with the Colts. Did you see that one on Twitter? Um, I saw a couple, like, but none that like it was were, one like, where amazing, he was really showing so. off the athleticism. It was one of those like designed to pressure up front, do a roll, move left, have to juke a guy, and then still hit, you know, a stationary target, like, mm-hmm. accurately. And it was one of those where it was like, oh, 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 okay. That's uh, that's a physical freak playing the position of uh, quarterback. And um, so it is it is that exciting time where you get those little things that pop up on Twitter, on Instagram, on the socials, and you see it and you're like, oh, that's right. Just reminding you that football is not too far away. It's the hype train that keeps hyping, even in the face of everyone knowing that these people are not in pads. These people are not playing against pass rushes. They're not having to read defenses. And yet every year we all get sucked into the same vacuum of highlights and excitement and speculation. And I'm here for it. That's why the NFL is so much fun. You don't get this for baseball. Like when, oh, oh, so-and-so hit a bomb in, um, you know, January, like that doesn't happen. You have spring yeah, training for a month uh, or a few weeks even, and n- none of that gets you like super amped up or anything because it's just spring training. It's just amazing how the NFL is able to do this and rile up a fan base 
Uh, yeah. Even though we all know it's just a, you know, you know, smoke screen for most part. The NBA has a little of this where you do see guys. It'll be like in another two months, like, you know, around August when you'll see like clips of, Oh, did you see KD come running up at this gym in New York and just right. go yeah, off for right. like 30 or like Joel Embiid challenge these guys at a local park and just like dunking like that's fun. Uh, you get a little of that, but no, the NFL has started to really capitalize on the off season social content. And it's uh, a lot of it is just, it's delicious. I will say Embiid better not be playing uh, basketball outside of, you know, train facility or uh, any, any of those deals. The guy what needs to, uh, to stay maybe healthy. stay healthy for a little bit. I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's kind of uh, what's going on this week in the NFL, but we have a couple other news items. Uh, to touch on uh, another big gambling strike down. Uh, they, it was kind of teased uh, over yeah. the weekend that, hey, there's going to be a Colts player that isn't a star, but Colts fans may know him, and he's going to be the subject of another crackdown in terms of the gambling saga. But this one's a particularly interesting, Mark. Uh, cornerback Isaiah Rogers Sr. Uh, is facing a big-time suspension and or penalty for a pe- supposedly placing roughly uh, or over, I can't remember what the exact wording was, but it was a hundred bets uh, throughout the uh, the course of the last season on the Colts themselves, yeah. and he did most of this apparently uh, inside of the facility as well. We saw the recent news come out with the Lions uh, grouping of teammates, but this one is different in and of its own. Because he was betting on his own team, for one. Yeah. This is like very Pete Rose-esque. And the quantity, like over 100 bets being placed uh, in the team facility. So uh, Ian Rappaport was discussing today on Pat McAfee that this could possibly be a case of being banished from the NFL in which he would have to apply for reinstatement. Yeah, I'm, I mean, listen, I'm all for banish if he bet on games he played on with his team. You just cannot do that. You cannot uh, do insider. that. I mean, this is like, we're talking like felonies here, I believe. And I, and listen, I'm telling you what right now, the NFL script writers, they are giving us heat already. I mean, this is great. This <laughs> yeah, is I juicy know. content. Uh, and I'm, you know, you feel bad for this guy when he read his script to be like, you're going to go to jail. Now uh, you we're going to, we're going to pin betting games on you. I bet he hated that when he got to that part of the script. Uh, but that's, that's, you know, NFL scripted. So that's just the way it goes. I um I, I I'll say this in all seriousness. This is the thing that the NFL has to keep doing. They have to keep on this. They have to keep being tough on these penalties because the only way you continue to have some integrity while also getting really fat wealthy off of the gambling is by having strong rules and making sure your players and your coaches and your, and your team officials and your referees are following those strong rules. You are, you are, you know, it's one of those things. It's funny where, what do they always say? Like, um, you know, people get mad when people get canceled. They always say like, he should be allowed to say what he wants to say. It's America, like freedom of speech. This is bull. Well, Yes. He's not going to jail for saying what he said, you know, to a point, unless he was threatening like to kill someone or whatever. Yeah, you have that freedom. But companies also, American companies, the National Football League, have the freedom to fire you or tell you you can no longer work for us based on your conduct and how you be- on how you behave. Like that is the their freedom as well. And so uh, it's to me, it's a classic example of that is that. I, I think it's silly for NFL players not to be allowed to. They should be able to bet on NBA games. I don't care if they're betting on college basketball. Um, I think as long as they're staying away from college football and as long as they're staying away from NFL football, then they should be allowed to gamble. Now, maybe not in the facility. Maybe there should be some sort of rule like, hey, guys, let's be smarter than this. If you're in an NFL facility, uh, a team facility or any, any way, shape, or form, don't do it be smart but yeah download the app go to the sports books on the weekend have fun you should be allowed to do that as long as it's not on the nfl or college football like peter schrager 
He works for the NFL. He can't even play fantasy football. He's not allowed because it's just the way it goes. Unless they are like part of like the fantasy league that then they promote and that they monitor. So it's just the way it works. He's not allowed to gamble on football because he's an NFL employee. Certain jobs have certain, uh, come with certain, is it, you know. Is it just because he's an NFL employee or is it also because he is privy to knowledge Well, that maybe others don't know? And that's that's where that I don't understand. That, to me, that's what makes the penalty wide should be even harsher. He's not a water. But that, I mean, that makes it criminal, does it not? I mean. I, I, mean, I could. I, it very well could. I mean, you could take it in the same sense as that. Martha Stewart went to jail for insider trading because she had yeah, information. Yeah. And Tim and Donna, Donahue, right? The M yeah. NBA ref uh, that, he, you know, he that, that was intense. He fixed, literally fixed the games, but yeah. Uh, and I, so I, but I wonder even letting them, I, and I don't know how you could regulate it. That's what's, you know, confusing to me about this, but if you're an NFL player, you're, you're likely good friends with NBA players, MLB players. Could you not yeah. also be privy to getting insider info from your friends and making bets on their behalf? You know, like That's hypothetically tough, though, though. A, a Knicks player yeah. paying a Yankees player, hey, put a bet down well, for me it, on our Knicks game because so and so is, you know, gonna be not gonna be playing. Like, I don't know. If you're dumb enough to do that and get caught, then you should you should get in trouble for sure. Yeah. I yeah. think um and I think the NFL is gonna watch these things. They're gonna be very, very keen on this stuff. And they should be. Um, we'll have to wait and see what the whole penalty is. I don't you know, want to overreact or spend too much time, but I'm already telling you, and I want it out there from my perspective, I'm 100% comfortable with lifetime ban um, if it comes out that he actually did place bets on games, NFL games, and games he played in. You know, Calvin Ridley got a year for doing parlays on stuff he wasn't even in and involved in and shouldn't have done it. Cause it's against the rules, but a year up he's back in the league and he's with Jacksonville and he's going to have a great year, I think. But if you are betting on games that you are in, um, yeah, I mean, that is next the ultimate, level, ultimate, no, no, it's the ultimate, yeah. uh, here's your sign. Don't do it. And, uh, you, and you should be absolutely punished for that. And they should send, use him as an example to keep guys on the round the league from doing stupid things. It's what the the NFL, you know, has historically done, right? Is like put the crack, the hard hammer down on something before it gets out of control. Because you know, gambling is not going away; it's it's growing exponentially, especially with these partnerships with the uh, uh, networks. And so, the NFL has to get out ahead of this as much as possible to say yeah. we're not going to make our sport a full of athletes who are, uh, you know, influencing the spreads to a degree Anytime that's uh, there's unsustainable. A fumble or a, a tip ball that doesn't get picked or, or anything like that. You you'll have to question it if you're not having strong crackdown uh, stuff by players. And I'll just end yeah. by saying this, just because they're going to lay the hammer down doesn't mean it's going to stop everyone from doing it. There's going to be stupid dudes. I mean, how many more examples do you need of don't do stupid things? And Henry Ruggs still drove a hundred and what, like yep. uh, 40 miles an hour and killed a woman. Like, People are going to do dumb things. So it's going to happen again. This will be a story as long as gambling is legal. Um, and you just got to now know that I think this will set the precedent for the type of infraction and what the penalty is for that type of infraction. And then you kind of, you can kind of figure out where you're going to be in trouble at. If you're, if you're like, all right, I'm going to do the stuff that, that um, Ridley did. And, and if I get caught, so what I lose year or whatever, I'm going to try it. I'm going to do it because I want to do it then you make your bet and you you try to do that. But if you're going to bet on games you play in and then the result is you lose everything, then I think that will it will prevent maybe, you know, at least a couple more guys from doing dumb doing making that dumb decision. It's what comes with the territory, no question. Uh final note uh before we get into Tom Brady and then our uh teams uh, that will have the biggest change from year to year. The Bills signed Leonard Floyd, former Bear, former Los Angeles Ram, outside edge rusher, uh, to join the group that includes Shaq Lawson, Von Miller, Gregory Rousseau, AJ Epinesa. Yeah. Some big time moves here from the Bills. Like Leonard Floyd is one of those guys, right? That's uh not the hottest uh, you know, free agent commodity 
in the league, but has, you know, for a former first round pick, like he never panned out to being what, you know, Von Miller obviously has carved out for his career or even, you know, other first rounders that just live very up to that building, but he's carved out a nice career for himself. For the, for the Rams, when they won the Super Bowl, yep. he was very good. He led them in sacks for a year or two there. Um, he's turned into a nice NFL player, certainly not what the Bears hoped he would be when they drafted him high. Yeah, I like this move. I think this move is you you know you're going to have him fresh, and you know you're going to have him ready to go in the good weather months in Buffalo for the first seven or eight games while Vaughn is still getting healthy. And then when Vaughn gets back, him and Vaughn are just going to be a rotating you're fresh, you go in. You're fresh, you go in. You're fresh, you go in. And and hopefully then they have a little extra cushion in case one of them goes down. I think it's absolutely smart. Th these are the type of moves that you only make if you are in a position where you feel you will be playing in late January, early February. The Bills certainly should feel that way. They should make the move. I would be questioning this move if it was the Texans or – uh, you know, uh, uh, the Buccaneers the resigning like, them. Man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like what are you, you know, what are you, what exactly is the motive there? But it just makes a ton of sense in Buffalo. For sure. Totally agree with that. Uh, Tom Brady's been making the rounds with the media since his yeah, retirement yeah. and it's becoming a Disney little bit World more the other day. Wait, say that again. He was in Disney world too. The other day on his social media. Oh, Posted that's a, right. Know, that's right. Tom Ratera with his, uh, with his daughter. There you go. Living it up in Florida is Tom Brady. He's getting set, obviously, to have, uh, you know, his year off doing what uh, he likes to do, including, you know, potentially becoming a part owner. It's it's pretty much already set in stone. It just like a couple, you know, I's have to be dotted and T's crossed. Uh, but being a minority owner of the Las Vegas Raiders and then in the 2024 season, he is set to begin his broadcasting career with Fox and that gigantic contract, but he's gone on a couple shows, Rich Eisen. Um, I think went on Ross Tucker, went on a couple other shows, obviously made the rounds. He is, uh, he is officially confirming uh, to everyone in these shows. Cause they're all asking the same question. Everyone's thinking about, is it possible Tom that you might come back and play in 2023? He's kind of put the kibosh on that and said, absolutely not. He's officially done. I personally don't see Tom Doing another reversal uh, just doesn't seem to be uh, within kind of uh, his character because he's such a perfectionist. I don't think he would want to start with the team in late fall or even, you know, late summer yeah. uh, before the season. So, uh, but it's it's good to get the confirmation from him firsthand. And he has said in all of these interviews that I've seen that he's really looking forward to his broadcasting career as well. So I know there's like some speculation about like what, you know, we even talked about it. Like, is his broadcasting career going to start before it even be or stop before it even starts? Yeah. Uh, because of his, you know, minority ownership with the Raiders on the horizon and potential other business dealings. But as of right now, it looks like Tom's like fully committed to training and researching this season to how to become a good broadcaster for Fox. You know, I will say you go back to when he went to Tampa. Remember, it was all the reports like, there was, he was at a high school day one, already throwing to Scotty Miller and was Gronk was down there. So I agree with you. I think he's done. If he was playing Tom plays like, and he's a, he's a hundred percent on, he's not Aaron Rodgers. where I'll show up and we'll make it work. And don't worry. We'll build this yeah, thing on the fly. Yeah. Um, I still, the broadcasting thing to me is still going to be a little bit of, I got to wait and see because obviously it's just, we've never had owner broadcaster and what is he allowed to say? What's he not allowed to say? What's, is he allowed to come in his own team and things like that? I'm sure Fox and them will figure it all out. And if there's ever a conflict where it's a Raiders game on Fox, I don't, I just bet he won't be doing it. I mean, I think it's probably going to be as simple as that. Uh, I'm ready for it. I'm very ready for Brady. This stage of Brady's career, Brady reminds me. And, and I, this is, it, it makes you sad to say it, but it's true. He reminds me a lot of Kobe Bryant. Like Kobe was, it's that, that's such a tragedy because you just, everything was lining up for this dude to just be so successful and great in so many venues and avenues in his life. Kobe would have been joining the TNT guys every once in a while. He would have been joining the ESPN guys. He would have been running businesses. He probably already would be absolutely in ownership group somehow, like very smart, very savvy, just 
you want him in the room, not just because of his name, but because he actually brings a ton to the table. Tom feels a lot like that. Very similar to Peyton Manning, where it's like, no, no, no. He's not just a name. Brett Favre was just a name. Put me on in some Wrangler jeans and I'll sell it. Like I could be a pitch man. Um, Brady has the Kobe Manning Shaq vibe where it's like, no, no, no. They're more than just a pitch guy. These, these dudes are smart. They're savvy. They make great decisions. They are hungry. They're go-getters. Um, very, very excited to see what this stage of Tom's career is like. And, and I think in the end, if he's trying to become an owner and doing all this stuff, it makes it's starting to make more sense now why he's taking this year off from broadcasting. Because I do think he wants to enjoy a year of retirement, get his you-know-what together, and then when he goes into broadcasting, now he'll feel comfortable being all in on it. And perfecting the craft. I think he wants to spend yeah. some time where he can just focus on listening to the broadcast instead of watching yeah. the film, right? And so he can kind of get both sides of it. I mean – you and I have been in agreement about this. He's going to knock it out of the park. He's going to be great from a presentation standpoint, from a vocal standpoint, stories. Uh, and information stories, all of the above. Uh, he, he's going to be fa- great at it. And in years down the road, when we do another top 100 list of players of all time, he's probably going to be the host of it, you know, and uh, and breaking down all of the players. Who's on my awesome. team? <laughs> he's, yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, reassuring to hear him, uh, confirm some of those things and, um, you know, excited to, to see what, what's ahead. Plus in the meantime, Greg Olson won another award, uh, for his outstanding performance as a broadcaster with Fox. So my, my biggest hope is that they both stay on because I don't want Greg Olson, uh, you know, Fox puts on a superior product in my view, in terms of presentation. Um, than pretty much any network when it comes to sports. And they have the and best so, pregame show. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. Um, and so, yeah, you would, you would hate to see them lose Greg Olson. If they could find a way to keep him and Tom Brady, I mean, we're talking the dynamite, you know, cornerstone for the next decade yeah. plus. To or Greg Olson stuff. could command a lot in the market to be someone else's number one or, you know right. what I mean, like to move on in. Yep, Exactly. All right, Mark, let's get to our uh, three teams each. We've each selected three teams that we expect to see the biggest change from last year to this year, good or bad. So some of these teams will have better records in our eyes. Uh, Some will have worse records in our eyes than they did a year ago. So excited to see the rationale and discuss this uh, further. So, Mark, without further ado, I will let you kick things off here for us. Who is your first team that you expect to see a big change this year? Change and turn and face. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, David Bowie. To me, out, yeah. to me, the obvious one that I feel very strong about. I as the, as the off season goes on, I think I'm gonna end up feeling stronger and stronger about. But I'm giving you a peek into my my brain right now. Is the Jacksonville Jaguars? I feel very strong getting into not just double digit wins, but high end double digit wins. They were nine and eight last year. I see the Jacksonville Jaguars improving into that 12, 13 win category. And, and a lot of this is based on the fact that what's happened around Jacksonville in their own division, Tennessee, Indianapolis, Houston, all feel like they're at this weird crux. Indy and Houston are at the very beginning in a total rebuilds for both of them with rookie quarterbacks. And uh, and Tennessee is 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 clinging on to that last glimmer of this final run with this group, and we all know how that goes. It's never as good as you want it to, especially with a group that was never really Super Bowl uh, ready or capable, anyways. So I say I feel confident Jacksonville improving three to four wins, possibly being number one overall seed in the AFC. That's the type of thing, uh, jump I'm seeing for Jacksonville. I feel confident in that, starting with the fact that I think they, they go 6-0 and in division. And any team that goes 6-0 and in division that you feel confident about, it's then really easy when you look at their schedule to get them to double-digit wins. You know what I mean? Sure. And yeah, Jacksonville sure. has some great breaks in their schedule. There's some tough games, but Jacksonville, if I'm saying they're 6-0 and at home, they uh, 6-0 in division, they then have home games against Atlanta and Carolina. 
two teams they're obviously better than and in win now mode. So all of a sudden that's eight wins right there, right? Six in division, Carolina, Atlanta, eight wins. They've already matched basically last year's total. And then they have away games with the Buccaneers and the Browns. Buccaneers, I expect to nosedive. Uh, the Browns, I don't have a ton of faith that they're going to be a rise or a fall. I feel like they're going to be around the same thing, seven, eight, nine win team that will lose a bunch of games they should have won and win a bunch of games they probably shouldn't have. I think a Jacksonville team, absolutely, I favor them in a matchup with the Browns. Oh, there's 10 wins there. And then, yeah, there are some tough games, but they get Ridley. They've improved their offensive line. Second year for Doug Pierce in that system, and we expect – third-year growth from Trevor Lawrence. I think Jacksonville is a big riser for me on this list. Yeah, the writing is on the wall for that, for sure. I You mentioned, you know, the, the fact that you got through the, you know, me and potatoes of it, and at the very end was, oh, yeah, and third-year Trevor Lawrence. Like, that, yeah. that's a huge, you know, <laughs> so that's, I mean, there's so many factors that make Jacksonville a contender this year, uh, not the least of which is, you know, T-Law making that huge jump and we see a lot of jumps come from like freshman to sophomore seasons in the NFL at quarterback. This is really his sophomore season with Doug Peterson. So it's, we could see a massive leap from Trevor Lawrence in this one, just yeah. because of that uh, alone. So I do agree with you there. I think they're going to be a, a much improved unit and they already, they made the playoffs, you know? So yeah. we're, we're talking about a team that, you know, it has proven success already. Can I just say this? This is this is something I want our listeners to think about. It's something that I've been thinking about. And I, I want to know from them and from you if if you get the same sense. Because I, I feel this is the type of year where the number one and number two seeds will not actually be the best teams in each conference. Uh, and, and I mean that in the sense that last year was pretty obvious that the Eagles being the one seed – they were great. And, 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 and the Niners we had to convince ourselves with Brock putting that roster, you know what I mean? Like I feel this is the type of year where the Kansas city schedule is so brutal. They've been so lucky with health. They may have a, a moment in their schedule where they really dip off and end up being a third seed. You know what I mean? But in the end, they'll probably make it to the Super Bowl. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like yeah. Yeah. Buffalo the AFC East is really improved. It's really tough. Buffalo could go from 13 to 11 wins and be a better team. I just want our listeners to just remember that and say that. That's a fair point. Just, be, just because Jacksonville could be the one seed, I don't know if Jacksonville will be the best team. I think they're going to be a very darn good team. And we know how much home field matters in NFL playoffs. Um, so they could end up being the team that represents the AFC, but I do think that it's just one of those going to be one of those years where we look at it in seven, eight months from now, we're talking about the number one overall seeds, kind of like the year your Steelers were like 11 and 0. We're like, okay, yeah, they're number one right now, but are they the best team? I, I don't know. I mean, they're really good. We feel they're good, but are they the best team? I think we're going to have a little of that in some cases because of the schedule this year for certain teams that are risers who aren't yet elite contenders. Yeah, I could see that. I think that's uh, well said, well articulated. Good job. Solid. Uh, the Colts, some of the staying division, are the first team for me. Probably a bit of a surprise here, but they did, they went 4-13 and 13 last season. It was about as bad for Indy as it's been and since Andrew Luck left. And, you know, a lot of that was just kicking the can down the road with old quarterbacks and never having an established yeah. thing, switching coaches, you know, Frank Reich, then Jeff Saturday, and now you get Shane Steich in there. I think this is a moment for the Colts. It, it, they're in an interesting place where, yes, they have a rookie quarterback. Yes, they have a rookie head coach. But they have a roster that's pretty good. Like, they have, they have a lot of pieces to work with, wow. and it kind of gives me the feeling of what we saw with Philly two years ago with mm -hmm. Nick Sirianni coming into a situation where you had a really young quarterback and a pretty solid defense and good personnel around him. And within a year, they're in the Super Bowl, you know, and we were all like, ah, I'm not sure what Nick Sirianni is kind of a goofball and uh, gave a really awkward press conference, uh, but he, but he performed right away. And then a year later they were in the Super Bowl. 
I, the Colts went four and 13. I just, I have a hard time thinking that this team can't get to eight wins this year, even with Anthony Richardson. And the only reason I say that, because if Anthony Richardson was on Houston or if Anthony Richardson was in Tennessee, I wouldn't feel that way about Anthony Richardson. I think he's literally in the most perfect spot that he could have gone with the guy who engineered the Jalen Hurts offense. It makes too much sense to have him being Anthony Richardson's head coach. I think even if Richardson's going to have bumps in the road his first year, I think with his style of play and with the roster that they have and Jonathan Taylor to join him in the backfield, I think even if at at the very least they're going to be a dominant run team, and I think that's enough to get them to eight wins, possibly even nine, competing in a bad division. And really, as you mentioned, like Jacksonville – the only team I would see kind of getting in their way as it pertains to the division. Uh, I think they have the second best roster in that division. And therefore I see them going from the bottom or, you know, the bottom with Houston uh, to a a solid number two in uh, the AFC South this year. Yeah. I don't hate that take. Uh, The only thing I will say that I would argue is that I think the Colts will be a riser. I just don't know if it'll actually reflect drastically in the win column. I think you're going to see a team that has an identity. I think you're going to see a team that feels improved, but it may only mean they get five or six wins, but we leave the season still feeling like, damn, that's the team to look out for next year. Cause I, that is eight, nine wins in an AFC, even though they have a lot of easy, easy games. And they do. If you look at the schedule, it's very easy. It's I'm going to, I'm going to pump the brakes a little bit on, Steichen, the head coach, and AR-15. I, I think he I, – I love what they have, and I love that there's clarity. Um, But I got to – Well, here, I, I mean, gonna, here's, here's my slight rebuttal. Believe. I'll see it to – I'll wait to see it to believe it a little bit. It, it gives me vibes of – and I know it's AFC versus NFC, and that was part of your point, but gives me vibes of, like, the Falcons. The Falcons were atrocious last year, and they went seven and ten. True. The Falcons won seven games last year, they did. and they were a dumpster fire. But because they ran the ball so well, True. they were able to they were able to control a lot of games and control the pacing. And then they, you know, yeah, they got a little lucky sometimes. I just feel like the Colts have a way better defense than the Falcons had last year, and if they can mirror some of that run game success which I certainly think they can they have a better running back than the Falcons had last year and a better running quarterback than the Falcons had last year that's where I think they can they I could see them easily getting to eight wins based on that factor but you know what we'll see time will tell I that's one of those as we get close to the season we might have to make a bet on the over under Colts because I'm I might I might now just lean hard against you on this one I have to do more research let me look at it um, <laughs> my next one is going to be a faller, a team that I think is poised to take a step back. And that is the Dallas Cowboys, America's team, 12 and five last year. Dak was brutal. I mean, he only played in 12 games. He led the league in, uh, interceptions besides Josh Allen. And, but I mean, if you look at the actual attempts and everything, his interception percentage was insanely high. Um, and I think this is a team that uh, opposite of Jacksonville goes back down to about 500. The thing I think, I think there'd be a more precipitous drop for Dallas. If Washington, I had more faith and I think Washington's going to go into the tank. And I think they should, because I think they're getting a new owner. I think they're going to get a new name. I think they should, they should go all in on Caleb Williams, Drake may, and just reboot, reboot, fire the coach after this year and have a bad year. I don't know if Ron will let it totally bunk on out. They might have to fire Ron, though, at some point in time to do what they need to do. That's a little bit of my bold prediction for Washington. But so Dallas, to me, Dallas is poised to fall out of the playoff spot. I don't love what they did with their offensive coordinator. Kellen Moore was, I think, if there, if there are brains in the operation in Dallas offensively, I believe it was Kellen Moore and his relationship with Dak. And that's gone now. And you have Mike McCarthy basically saying, good, now we can run the ball more. And yeah, and there's no Zeke. 
And Tony Pollard is coming off a gigantic injury. They spent a lot of money on him. He's not going to be ready for the start of the season. I love Deuce Vaughn out of Kansas State, but he is 5'5", and he's fun. And I don't know, but I don't know if we want to Wait, be- is he actually 5'5"? Five, five? He's literally 5'5". Five, five. He's an, he's watch Oh, my Deuce gosh. Vaughn. Watch Deuce Vaughn highlights Kansas State. He, he, I wanted the Bears to draft him so bad. Now, I'm glad they got Roshan Johnson and, and they went a different direction, but I would have been all for it because he's just fun. Like, he's just electric. He's a, like a – he is Like a Darren Stroll out there. Yeah, very much, very much. Um, I, I just think things could start falling apart this year in Dallas. Defensively, they held on last year after two years ago having a really great defense. I think it takes another step back. Um, I think offensively, they add Brandon Cooks to help with the CD Lamb and give him another weapon. I, I just don't love it. Their offensive line is aging quickly, and I think that Philadelphia goes two and zero against Dallas. And I think Dallas maybe, if they're lucky, splits with New York and Washington, and and that's tough. All of a sudden, then you're saying I'm thinking four losses in division. That's really tough to overcome uh, when you're when you're trying to when you're trying to make a playoff run. And Dallas has some tough opponents, home against the Lions, Seattle, and the Rams. I expect all those teams to be able to compete with or beat Dallas in Dallas next year if the Rams are healthy. And away games. Oh, they also have home games against the Jets and the Patriots. A Jets team, primetime, Aaron Rodgers, we know what he does to the Cowboys. I know it's a different different thing for Aaron Rodgers, but that's Aaron Rodgers versus the Cowboys. He loves playing in Jerry's world. He loves putting on a show against Dallas. And I think the Patriots, I trust their coaching, at least that to be a tough game. Like, that's not an easy, you could, that's a go either way game. So I just gave you five home games that I think could be tough. If they go three and two in that stretch, I'd be very shocked. If they go three and two against Lions, Seattle, Rams, Jets, Patriots at home. And then away games, they have a brutal schedule. They have to go at the 49ers, at the Chargers, at the Bills. Those are three yeah, losses yeah. for the Dallas Cowboys on the road. I'm sorry, but I'm chalking those up as losses right now. They are they are at a deficiency overall against all those opponents, either coaching, quarterbacks, or defense in, in, in key matchups and all that. And so when you pile up the fact, I think they they'd be lucky to go three and three, two and four in division with a tough uh, slate of home games and a, an zero and three in the road. I just don't see them getting the double digit wins. I think it's a pullback year for Dallas. Yeah, I mean, neither of us have ever been high on Dallas. Never kind of bought the hype that's come with Dak Prescott and just how that team has run. I'll be interested to see what the offense looks like with Mike McCarthy feeling that he has a, a greater hold on what they want to do. I, I agree with you, Callan Moore. I think airing it out was able to get the best out of, you know, the team. I think Tony Pollard, whenever he does come back, if he is ready early on, is an upgrade over Zeke at this point in his career. But other than that, there's so many other, you know, troubling factors and improved division still really tough uh, op opponent in the NFC in Philly uh, in your own backyard. And I think the the commanders are going to be better actually than they were last year, uh, but still not enough to really move the needle much, but better nonetheless and in a, in a tougher out for the Cowboys. So that's going to be difficult. I'll make this next one super fast, Mark, because uh, I don't need to say much. I have one bullet point. Um, the Broncos are my pick here. They went five and 12 last year. Rookie head coach, Nathaniel Hackett, uh, Russell Wilson, seemingly kind of, fell off. There was no chemistry at all on that team. No direction. Uh, my one bullet point, Sean Payton. That's my argument. Yeah, he'll improve them. Yeah. I mean, it just, there's too much uh, good on that team. There's Jerry Judy. There's Cortland Sutton. There's, you know, playmakers in the backfield. Uh, Javante Williams, when he comes back from injury was, uh, you know, a, a highly touted young running back just a couple of years ago, still young, uh, super talented. They have pieces on defense still. And uh, I just don't buy that Russell Wilson is as bad as we saw it last year. He may have definitely missed a step in his career and is on the downslide. Uh, but I don't think last year was the worst that we've seen of Russell Wilson or the, the, you know, best that we'll see of Russell Wilson moving forward. I think he's going to improve and uh, have somewhat of a bounce back year, maybe most improved player who knows, but yeah, that's, yeah. 
That's all I have to really say about the Broncos. Here's the Broncos are the easiest team to just to just have a take on. If they are not drastically better, then it's obvious what they will do. They have to move on from Russell Wilson. Unless he's putting up insane numbers, which that's then a weird world where it's like I t- if I were to yeah, tell you yeah. it's October 31st, Russell Wilson is lighting it up, not turning it over and the Broncos are still losing, I'd be like that doesn't exist. I don't know how that exists. Um, and so they, they're going to be fun because they are going to be such a storyline for us all to digest. Uh, my final team, I'm going to go with an improving team. I mentioned them just a bit ago, the Rams, the Rams are a five win team that I think can very much get back to being a nine, 10 win team and a playoff team in the NFC. Now, obviously my number one bullet point has to be, this relies on Matt Stafford returning to Matt Stafford form his first year with the Rams. If Matt Stafford is not back to Matt Stafford, none of this matters that I'm about to say. So let me have that Matt Stafford returns to Matt Stafford form. He's figured out the elbow injury. Everything's good. He's healthy to start the season. They have a very workable schedule. Um, Yes, San Francisco and Seattle in division are tough, but I'd argue, say they, say they go two and two versus San Francisco and Seattle. They split their home. They win their home games, they lose their away games, right? We kind of say those three teams beat up on each other a little bit. Arizona's in the tank. They get Arizona two great times, both of them pre-Kyler Murray coming back if he was going to come back. That helps them. So 2-0 and versus Arizona. They have, a, they have on the road very winnable games. Dallas, Green Bay, Giants. Those are their tough away games. And Colts, Indy, Errors in the Dallas Green Bay Giants. That that could be 4-0, depending on how the Rams are playing. Aaron Donald healthy. You forget about Cooper Cup, Matthew Stafford, that offense. Uh, they improved. They had a ton of draft picks. They're going to have a ton of youth on this team. It's, you're going to see this team start flying around the football. Um, they add weapons offensively. Their offensive line got better. Um, so I love those away matchups. I think they could go 4-0 in the Dallas Green Bay Giants. And then their home games, they have a very workable home schedule. Besides their divisional opponents, you're talking about New Orleans, Washington. Those are very much winnable games for them. Cleveland, very winnable game for them at home. And then Pittsburgh, who I think will be improved. But again, that's a long trip for Pittsburgh. It's a 305 start. So you're getting a weird like five o'clock Eastern time start for the putt for the, for Pittsburgh I, I, and a long road trip for them. And then they do have to play the Eagles, but again, at least they get the Eagles at home. So I think, I think the Rams are a team. They added coaching talent. They added a ton of youth to this team, way more depth. Sean McVay is back in fully focused. This is the Super Bowl hangover is done. Stafford healthy. I think this team is poised to bounce back to battling for the playoffs, if not making the playoffs in the NFC. Yeah. Matt Stafford's got to be the guy that drives that train. No question about it. Uh, I don't think Stetson Benton Bennett is uh, going to be no. able to lead this team to notoriety, but they're just, they're an aging team. They're, they're old. They have remnants of like the Tennessee Titans, except better, you know, yeah. they, they are a team that's, that's clinging to this last vestige of hope. Uh, to make a run count and absolutely uh, they've got a couple years left potentially uh, depending on the health of at Stafford as you mentioned and even if he's not you know fully healthy for like another three years maybe they can eke one solid year out of Matt Stafford and and get themselves in contention for the playoffs but I do think it's going to be a really tough run for them like it's going to they're going to have to earn yeah, every one of those victories. Nothing's going to, I don't see them lighting up the NFL like they did a couple of years ago. No, no. And I'll just say this. I think my final point on the, on the Rams will be that I don't want to reveal all of it yet, but I am strong. I am once again, I feel like I'm the Bernie Sanders meme. I am <laughs> once again coming to you and going to say that I think the Niners are are going to have a rough year. And I know, I know I got beat up for it last year. I thought the Niners would have a rough year and they didn't, but I'm, I'm very, very iffy on, you know, the NFL, you forget the NFL is filled with a lot of smart dudes and Brock Purdy 
I, I get I get the hype and the love. I do. But are we really, really thinking to ourselves in a 17 game schedule, Brock Purdy's gonna be that guy? And that NFL defensive coordinators, great minds like McVeigh and like Pete Carroll and their staffs aren't gonna be able to handle Brock Purdy. And now the thing that the Niners will always have going for them is their roster. But all I'm asking you in believing in me that the Rams will go to a 10-win team and compete for the playoffs or be in the playoffs is basically allowing to say the Niners and the Rams will split one and one. They each win their home games. You agree with me on that? Fine. Then then the the roadmap is, the, is more there for the Rams to get to 10 wins than you think if you look at their schedule. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fair. Uh, my final team is the Minnesota Vikings, and you know, improving, we, right? Uh, They're going to take a giant. Thing. I have them taking a know? massive, precipitous fall, what? as you would say. Oh, Dan, <laughs> <laughs> they were thirteen and four last season. Uh, I have the Minnesota Vikings dropping off uh, quite Boo. a bit this year. Yeah. I disagree. Boo. Mr. NFC North is uh, not a fan. <laughs> apparently. Um, I love no, this. Look. I, I'm glad you took it. Cause I, I, I thought it would be unfair. I thought the listeners would know if I, I think they were all betting. I think I just lost some people some money that Mark was going to say Minnesota, of course, but right, I'm with right, you a hundred percent. So I'll let you make the argument. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, several factors that kind of play into this. I mean, for one, I feel they got lucky last year in a lot of games. They won a lot of close games that's not always a good indicator of future success. Uh, a lot of times that pendulum swings back the following yeah. year because you just don't get lucky like that all that often. And nothing suggested to me that, oh, these Vikings are grinders and able to, uh, they're just built to withstand four quarters. Like they didn't strike me as that type of team. A lot of times they did uh, seemingly uh, just get lucky in some instances. Uh, but more than that, the division is greatly improved, I think. I mean, the Lions are not going anywhere. Uh, the the Packers, yeah. you can make uh, the argument that they've dropped without Aaron Rodgers, but we just yeah, don't, we know don't know much uh, about them. But I certainly think the Bears, I mean, the Bears were a team that I wanted to include here. They were in an honorable mention for me because I just don't see them winning only three games uh, after last season. I believe in Matt Eberflus. too much talent. Yeah, I, I like what he's building. They've added DJ Moore. They have a, a full off season with Chase Claypool there. They have, you know, a, a revamped backfield. Uh, so there's a lot of good things happening in Chicago, and it's just got to make things difficult for the Vikings to replicate a 13 and four season it, that was, by all accounts, a fraudulent 13 and four. And we were saying that towards the end, you know, and and you with your Super Bowl playing updates Giants. was always like, this is this is a team that's not a serious Super Bowl contender, even though they were in the upper echelon uh, in terms of the seating, in terms of the record in the NFL. And then looking at their schedule, I I see them instantly starting off two and three with three losses in the first five games. And they had yeah. four all of last year. They're, see, they are primed for a 10 win season this year. I, I could take it a step further in their seven first seven games. I think it's very plausible. They, they're three and four through seven. Yeah, they, I, they have to go at Philly on a Monday on a Monday night. We uh, we know what that means for Kirk Cousins. Like that right, is exactly. a loss. Yeah, they yeah, are. Yeah, then they have the sure. Chargers at home. We expect the Chargers That's to be better. I think they lose against the Chargers. They have at Kansas they're home against Kansas City. Don't have faith in them against Kansas City. That defense will get eaten up by Patrick Mahomes. Then uh, San Francisco on the road Monday night. Monday ESPN. night. Book so, that as a win for San Fran. Yeah, so you're talking about four big-time losses to four competing teams. And in that, you're then giving them a win at Chicago? I'm not. I think that's a very tough game. The Bears always play the Vikings well at home, and yeah, the Bears yeah. are better. Now, the Vikings have a stretch here after they get through that where they could rattle off wins at Green Bay, at Atlanta, home against New Orleans, at Denver, Chicago. No, Las Vegas. That is a stretch. Those last they, two are tough, but yeah. No, but that is a stretch where if you told me they they only lost one or two of those games and they and they got back in their season righted, I wouldn't be shocked. But sure, then again, sure. they end the season four 
really tough games at Cincinnati, home against Detroit, at Green Bay, home against Green Bay, at Detroit. And the Green Bay game is another primetime game. I'm letting you know now. I I mean, I'm I'm 99% sure I'm picking the Lions to win the North. So if you're telling me, I think part of the Lions winning the North is going 2-0 against Minnesota. So I, mm-hmm. I think that I, I think they're in a really tough stretch there down the road uh, at Cincy, home against Detroit, home against Green Bay on a primetime game. Kirk Cousins in primetime. We know how that works out. I expect the, the Packers, meanwhile, to get better as the year goes on. I think Jordan Love will struggle early. I think he'll figure his get his feet wet. He'll he'll figure it out by the end of the season and be a competent NFL player. Um, and so I think that's a it's a really tough thing for for Minnesota. I, I agree. I don't know if it's I, I'm not expecting Minnesota all of a sudden be a five win team, but I do think Minnesota is going to be there's going to be a a they'll win nine or ten games. That's the my NFC prediction. the NFC last year is going to be very reminiscent to the NFC this year, only it's going to be a lot of different teams. Remember, it was it was Minnesota and and um, uh, and um San Francisco and the Eagles just kind of running game. away. We were like, they have all the wins. And then Dallas was hanging around. They had good wins. And then there was like Giants, Washington, Seattle, Detroit, Green Bay. They're all bunched in the middle there and battling for those wild card spots. I think you're going to have a bunch – of teams, I think they're going to be different names, though. I think it's going to be Chicago, Green, uh, Minnesota, Rams, um, Seattle. I mean, I mean uh, Niners battling for those like five or six teams battling for those two, you know, three or four slots. Um, and we'll get to that more in depth. But I'm with you 100. percent Yeah, I so had that's, I had uh, another uh, honorable mention that I thought was worth saying. Sure, we kind of sure. talked about it really quickly already. I think the Buccaneers, I, I think the Buccaneers are poised to just fall apart. They're old. I do not believe in Todd Bowles at all. I have no faith in Trask or Mayfield. I think the Bucs are, are going to very much so be in play for number one overall pick 2020. Uh, That'd 2020 be ideal for Tampa, for sure. It would be. I think they are going to be very in play for that. Now, you argue they have, they still have some talent left. But how motivated will that talent be to perform? I feel similarly about Atlanta. They were one of my mentions, too. I mean, they won seven games. Like, I, I could see them being a three-win team this year. Yeah, um, it's weird. I, 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 I'm I with you in a sense. I don't. I think they're going all in on Ritter, and I, and I, I don't think that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, we just don't know how good. I mean, if they do fall off, and it's like Tampa and Atlanta battling for Caleb Williams, and, like, what if they both – what if they're one, two? Drake May followed by – uh, um, or preceded by Caleb Williams, uh, you know, that, that could easily be one, two. And then all of a sudden now we're talking about the NFC South and the AFC South as two divisions with just all young quarterbacks, yeah, except for Derek yeah. Carr, you know, that, that, that is certainly plausible uh, come next year. Very interesting to think about, no doubt. So yeah, that, those are e- each of our teams there that we think, uh, will be risers or fallers uh, from 2022 to 2023. Our very early predictions as mini camps get underway here. Still and a lot can change. A uh, lot can change. You know, June's a big month. July training camp. And uh, before we know it, preseason and the season. So hope you all enjoyed this episode. Uh, please check us out. As always, uh, on YouTube, give us a like here if you're watching. Subscribe really helps us out. And uh, always interact with us on social media. You can uh, give us your thoughts as well at Mark Hespin, at Dan Vasco. But for now, that'll do it for us here on the Football Lounge. Until next time.